Good morning and good afternoon. Welcome to today's uh, webinar. This is our RFF CMCC EIEE webinar. And today we are going to cover, uh, we're going to discuss uh, a book about technology transfer and innovation for low carbon development. Today's speakers are Miria Pigato and Simon Black. They will present, uh, we will start with Miria presenting the first part of the book and then say Simon, uh, who's going to go second, is going to talk more about the, uh, policies. And then uh, uh, Elena Verdolini is going to discuss uh, uh, the, these two presentations and opening, and, and she's going to open the Q&A session. So Miria Pigato is uh, a um, lead, leader of the Climate Action Group in the World Bank's Macroeconomics and Fiscal Management Global Practice, whereas Simon Black is an economist at the World Bank uh, within the Global Climate, Climate Change Research and Analytics Division. And they both have uh, worked extensively on the topic of uh, technology policies for technologies uh, um, and for the innovation in green, uh, in green technologies. The discussion, Ellen Verdolini is, uh, um, is a professor at the University of Brescia and also a member of the center of RFF CMCC uh, Center. And, She's gonna. She's worked extensively as well on innovation and uh, on green innovation. And so she's the best person, the most person to ask questions about this book. So, uh, just one word about the center. Uh, the center, as the name suggests, is the mer comes from the merging of forces from two institutions: the Resources for the Future in the US, uh, the US and the Europe. Mediterranean Center on Climate Change in Italy. And uh, these two institutes have joined forces in creating the European Institute on Economics and the Environment, uh, which uh, where we perform research on, uh, as the name suggests, environmental economics and climate uh, change economics. So um, I will just preview, uh, briefly tell you how this webinar is going to work. First, we're going to hear from the two speakers, then from uh, the discussion, and then um, we'll have a Q&A session. It is very important uh, to get questions that you look at, at the, uh, web, uh, the GoToWebinar uh, tool. If you click on the arrow and you open the tool, you're gonna be able to write down questions and I'm gonna moderate the questions at the end. You can either tell me, it's good if you tell me your name so that uh, that helps me uh, directing the question and naming you. And secondly, it's important if you wanna direct the question to one of the speakers so that you write so. Otherwise, I will, you know, think of who's the best person to ask the question, or maybe all of them will answer your question. Um, the webinar uh, will be recorded and uploaded on the CMCC YouTube channel. So if you want to see this again, you can uh, uh, go to the website. And uh, um, a final word on the forthcoming CMCC webinar. The next one is going to be on the 23rd of June at 12.30 uh, Central European time, and the topic is gonna be soil or erosion. So projecting rainfall eros erosivity and soil loss under climate change using Copernicus data. So now I'll leave the floor to Miria for the first part of the presentation. Thank you very much, Valentina. I, uh, do you see my screen at the moment? Is the presentation on? Yes. Yes, we yes. do, Miriam. Perfect. So let me start. So uh, thank you uh, and good morning to everyone. Uh, it's uh, good to start, uh, I think, from the COVID crisis and how this crisis is posing fundamental questions on the sustainability of our societies. 
Why there has been a remarkable economic and social progress, uh, there is uh, a sense that this growth model is becoming unsustainable. For example, some 80% of the energy in the world still comes from fossil fuel. So the report we are presenting today, Technology Transfer and Innovation for Low Carbon Development, tell us that solving the climate crisis, perhaps the defining problem of our time, is actually possible. The report is long, I'm sorry, it's about 200 plus pages, but there are uh, some key messages that I, I think are important. These are the important messages to remember. Uh, first, uh, we already had the tools and the technologies needed to contain global warming. Uh, second, these technologies need to be transferred on a massive scale to developing countries where most of the future emissions are expected to occur. And, and third, uh, and it's that transferring technology is not just a necessity for the climate change, but it's a great opportunity for developing countries for you know, better growth, uh, a sustainable growth. So I'll go through, uh, you know, a few, uh, let's, you know, uh, chapters if you want. We start with energy transitions, we move to innovations in low carbon technologies, and then how is the technology transfer? And then we singled out one country, China. China has done so well in low carbon, uh, both innovation and transfer. And finally, and this is the, the part that Simon will do, and it's the most important part, what kind of policies are going to support a low carbon transition? So a few words about the energy uh, transitions. The chart shows the evolution of different energy technologies in the last couple of centuries. 200 years ago, you can see, I mean, everybody was using biofuels, and that we mean uh, fuel, wood, charcoal, uh, dung, agriculture residues, uh, and these were the most important sources of energy. That was until coal came along. Um, coal replaced, uh, you know, to a certain extent, uh, traditional biomass and uh, and then more than half a century later we have oil came on board then there was the, in the 70s the oil, oil price shocks and so gas and then now we have a bunch of renewable energy but what you can see is that you know the uh, coal became the most important uh, um, energy source it took what about you know almost 100 years and the same was for uh, um, for oil, long, long time. Um, but the chart uh, showed two things. First, as I was saying, you know, it takes such a long time to become the dominant energy source. There are some uh, examples of rapid transitions that give us hope, including, for example, the adoption of nuclear power in France. But, you know, most of the transition take a long time um, because, of course, you, you, you have to get the right infrastructure in place, so you have to change the behavior so that people get used to develop all the policies and regulations that are needed. Uh, then what is interesting, what's, what's happening now? Um, we are moving to a more diversified landscape where no single fuel is dominant. And this is for the first time in history. So we still have some biomass fuels, particularly in rural areas, uh, Africa, uh, South, South Asia, et cetera. These are very uh, inefficient, polluting, but they're still used. And we have coal and oil and uh, they are here to stay maybe for a long time and maybe they will become less polluting but you know it's uh, will have uh, uh, a lot of choice and not a single one will be dominant for some time um some good news now the uh, the chart shows the uh, levelized cost of electricity uh, for different uh, uh, technologies uh, clean technologies 
And uh, uh, it's only from 2010 and 15, but I know that the cost have gone down very much after that. Uh, they've gone down particularly for solar photovoltaic and for solar thermal a lot. Now, of course, we use the levelized cost of energy because uh, this is the um, minimum uh, constant price at which electricity must be sold in order to break even over the lifetime of the project. So it's the right way to compare different uh, technologies. Now, why did the cost go down so much for certain technologies? Um, partly is technology, technological improvement, um, and then many governments are now using competitive procurement. That helps to get the prices down, auctions. Um, and then, you know, there are a large base by now of experienced, uh, internationally active project developers that can do their job very well. Now, one of the problems uh, when the costs are falling in um, is the difficulty to evaluate, you know, the growth in real terms. Um, so this is one of the few charts that I, I, I could find. Um, uh, that gives me both values and uh, uh, you know the real uh, uh, the, the real adjusted for uh, value adjusted for cost, and it comes from the International Energy Agency, and it shows uh, uh, the investment in uh, renewable energy. On the uh, left hand side, you have the chart showing that renewable investment has remained pretty stable at about 300 billion a year. Um, and that is kind of worrying because, you know, from 2010 to 2018, pretty stable is not what we want. But of course, that, you know, one reason is that uh, prices are falling. And in fact, uh, if they are adjusted for cost, uh, um, 2018 cost, you can see that actually there's been 55% increase from 2010 to 2018. Okay, so I was saying before that, you know, the, the one of the key messages of this book uh, is that, you know, um, we can do it. Most of the emission reduction necessary to reach the Paris commitment that can be achieved through the rapid diffusion of uh, uh, low carbon technologies. So here we do a kind of uh, experiment. Um, if you look at the chart on the left hand side, the uh, blue bar 65 um, is actually the the uh, amount of in gigaton of uh, uh, emissions that we could we would achieve between uh, up to 2030 without any mitigation policy it's actually a lot um, it's a lot because uh, um, if we were to uh, be on track with achieving the 1.5 degrees maximum of uh, uh, temperature increase by the end of the century, the maximum we should achieve in terms of emission is uh, 24 uh, gigatons. So the, the difference is, uh, uh, is huge, 41 um, uh, gigatons of carbon dioxide equivalent. However, if magically we could replace current fossil fuels with the renewable energy sources in the key sectors of the economy, that is energy, industry, transport and buildings, plus forestry and agriculture, uh, the deployment of, of these existing technologies could narrow the gap by almost two thirds. Um, just by summing up all the numbers that you see in the picture. Now, if you try some, you know, some new technology, not very much because, uh, as I say, how horizon here is 2030, but still, you know, some some new things would come along. Well, we will get approximately there. So um, good. So we we have seen we can do it. That is on paper. That is, you know, uh, extrapolating from some of the data that we have. 
Now, let's see how this could be done in practice. So we'll start with the um, innovation. And uh, um, we go to uh, okay, low carbon technologies. What, what are low carbon technologies? Um, I think that the simplest definition of low carbon technology is uh, a technology that produces power with substantially lower amount of carbon dioxide emissions than conventional fossil fuel power generation. That's kind of the simplest you know, definition that I could find. But once you define something, then uh, uh, empirically, how you know uh, that that's the difficult part. So we would include typically renewable energy sources and uh, like wind and solar innovation that produce uh, fewer emissions than their conventional equivalents, like you know electrical vehicles, uh, and then of course all kind of system improvements that can reduce carbon emissions, like public transportation, etc. So let's talk of uh, uh, innovations. How do we define the innovation? In this report, well, in, I, I guess it's it kind of convention, we use patent data from the World Patent Statistical Database maintained by the European Patent Office, and which covers the population of patents filed worldwide. And personally, I like to use patent because they are a measure of uh, um, the output of uh, innovation. I know there are several other measures, like you could have, you know, uh, spending in research and development, or I don't know, number of scientists, etc. But th these are all proxies, if you want, important, but still proxies. So anyway, if you can see, uh, I mean, from 1985, uh, this is the chart on the left hand side. Uh, the share of uh, uh, climate related uh, and we're talking about mitigation um, inventions increased uh, you know uh, it, this is incredible increase uh, from 85 to 2010 and we also plot the um, the oil price because uh, oil price and innovations in low carbon technology are very correlated uh, when the oil price goes down, well, you know, uh, people say, well, let, let's use the oil and forget about renewables, you know, kind of, this is actually what, what is happening now with the low price, uh, the, the price of oil is so low. But then we see that after 2012 to 2015, and I think it continued up to 2017, mm -hmm. there is a, a kind of uh, um, fall. In the, in, in the share of uh, these uh, climate te uh, technologies. And uh, um, we, we actually don't know very much uh, why. It, we know it is not a measurement error, has been confirmed by several studies. Um, partly it's because the oil uh, price plunged during the period, making renewable energy less competitive. Um, there was a lot less spending by, you know, public spending because of the um, great financial crisis and, you know, other priorities. But it, it's not very clear uh, why this happened. Now, the second part of the chart brings you the uh, growth, shows the, the growth of these uh, innovations in several sectors and, uh, you know, just uh, uh, particularly in energy, um, you know, uh, transportation, in all of the sectors, I mean, a very, very strong uh, in increase. Now, who are the innovators? Um, well, uh, um, the advanced economies, obviously. Um, United, Japan first, United States, uh, Germany, um, you know, Korea, and big surprise, China. Um, China climbed the, the, if you want, the, 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 all the stairs up to, to, to the top. And uh, um, it, it's still, you know, a kind of middle-income country. So, um, 
and uh, uh, some other countries that we're looking at them emerging countries like you know Mexico India South Africa um, all these countries are about uh, uh, you know number 50 54 you know in, in this range but China made it to almost the top with eight percent very very impressive uh, the, the second, the right hand side of the chart there looks at the, uh, you know, emissions and, and inventions. And the question is, are the countries that are inventing more, you know, that have more innovations in mitigation, are those with the, uh, you know, more emissions? And, uh, well, the answer is no. Uh, um, European Union is, uh, uh, you know, has a lot of innovations and so has uh, um, Japan, and that's the red, if you can see the stock of low carbon inventions. Um, but China, of course, emissions are, you know, uh, a, lot, a lot more. You would expect that China would innovate uh, more if you want. And, and again, um, a lot of other countries, uh, same thing. Um, most of the uh, developing and emerging countries, they, they don't have much innovations. So again, important thing, it's our message. Uh, it's so important that technology is transferred from the countries that are innovating to those that have most of the emissions. What about policies? Um, do they count or do they not count? Um, well, actually they they do, of course. Um, many, uh, you know, you would expect, of course, that uh, um, large countries, they, you know, they innovate more um, and they uh, and they also uh, transfer more, more, more technology. But um, what is what are the barriers actually that impede you know the, the transfer of uh, of technology? Well, we'll have Simon go into the detail in, into that, but um, definitely FDI controls are uh, an important uh, barrier and tariffs. Um, and the, the chart shows that by um, if countries like China, which by the way is uh, it's very close, it, it, you know, it has a lot of barriers. Um, if they could uh, uh, decrease uh, by 10%, you know, the FBI controls, they will get some 11% more um, in LCP transfer. Um, and particularly from uh, develop, developing countries, not just from high income countries. Okay, so let's uh, move to avenues for low carbon technology transfer. Okay. So empirically, you know, uh, while the definition of but technology is and uh, technology transfer is very simple, but in practice, uh, um, it that's not the case. Um, we it's not easy to find uh, one definition. So what we do, we create our own list of uh, uh, you know 107 traded LCT products by putting together three list uh, of uh, that, that exists uh, already and the one is the um the a list provided by the APEC country APEC countries i think there are uh, 54 um, products there um, the second is uh, um, a list of uh, um, provided by the World Bank and, and the other is from uh, some uh, um, academic articles. So let me go there. So we also did this list and uh, of, of products. So if you have a uh, uh, question, we can go more in details. 
but let's go quickly and see um, who is, you know, which countries are trading. Now, again, as you expect, you you can see, and that's the in the blue uh, color, high-income countries account for uh, you know most of the trade, both for imports and exports. We have some of the upper middle income countries, the orange uh, color, that are actually importing a lot, a lot more than they used to. But the low income, the the, the poorest countries, um, basically they are not in the even in the chart. It's it's red. They, they they were you know importing exporting a little bit in the past, and now basically you can't even see it in the chart. Okay, South South trade. So th this requires a bit of uh, of explanation because uh, um, when we started the, this report, uh, the idea was that we could find a lot of trade among uh, um, South, you know, South to South. How do we define South? Well, it, it's very simple. We take North are all the advanced countries, and all the rest is the South. I mean, given the progress in a number of middle-income countries, we thought there certainly is going to be a lot of trading there, partly because uh, uh, countries at the same level of uh, development uh, and kind of the same problems, they should be trading a lot among themselves. Um, and then we wanted to see if these kind, the, these exchanges are very different from, you know, the, the typical uh, north to south uh, technology exchange. Well, we don't find much evidence of south-south trade. Um, neither for all products or, you know, technology products, nor for the low-carbon technology products. Um, the chart shows uh, um, from 92 to 2016, and again, you can see the dominant trade is north to north um, and north to south. There is some uh, in, uh, increase, and that's very encouraging, of south to north, that's mostly again China, you know, with the, with the advanced countries, and the south-south uh, it's it's very very little very very little uh even by 2016 i think uh, it was just uh, some nine percent uh, not 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 much not much unfortunately okay um we move quickly i think now um countries with the large domestic market and technological cap capabilities of course attract a lot more um technology um, India, Brazil, Mexico, South Africa, and, and China. China, of course, invests a lot on, on, on its own, so that's why it's not number one. So let's spend a few last minutes on China. Uh, I've been studying actually China for many years, and, uh, and it, it is kind of always uh, um, uh, yeah, a, a surprise. So here in this chart, you see that among the emerging economies, China was the top importer and exporter of low carbon technology during 92 and 2016. In the chart is the blue, um, the blue uh, line. Um, and then it already dominates the uh, TV solar cell production. It's the, the blue again here and the, the EV market. Uh, I'm all, almost uh, um, at the end, but just uh, um, a few words on uh, how how did they do it? How did they do it? Um, and I wanted to put a couple of minutes on the electronic vehicles market. Uh, because uh, it's kind of extraordinary, you know. Um, so at the beginning, they, they started with the, a pilot program 2009, the so-called 10 cities, 1,000 vehicles program. And uh, the program was centralized, was a pilot, as you saw. Uh, there were a number of pilot cities, but 
course, they had some um, leeway, you know, these cities so to determine what models of cars to roll out. So th there was, you know, they were a little bit independent. And this first program was a failure. So it did not succeed because incentives were low. There were no uniform standards, a little coordination. Um, it was a big setback. But they react quickly and then they increased the, the level of subsidies um, and developed a network of charging facilities and service based on unified standards. So they learned and they moved on. And then uh, by 2015, in no time basically, they became number one in the world um, you know, for electrical vehicles. So how did they do it? And first uh, is, was the government vision support, like by building infrastructure network. Uh, second, uh, industrial policies were vital, of course, for the, the development and deployment. Then third was that, you know, and uh, the traditional automotive market was dominated by joint ventures with the foreign company. The EV market was dominated by domestic firms. And that's what you see in the picture here. Um, the uh, joint ventures are, you know, the, on the round circle on the outside. Um, and then you have um, uh, the uh, lighter col color, no, I'm sorry, the darker colors is the uh, domestic uh, uh, brand. Um, and they dominate the electrical vehicle market. And this is the surprising results and uh, why. So, you know, the, as you know, since the early 80s, the cornerstone of China's industrialization strategy was the trade technology for market policy, which required the foreign firm strategic sectors to form joint ventures with Chinese state-owned partners and therefore to share the technology with their Chinese counterpart. And this policy has been subject to a lot of criticism from everywhere. Um, and by the way, in 2018, the Office of the US Trade Representative published a report documenting China's unfair technology transfer regime for US companies. By contrast, the Chinese critics have argued that this policy, the technology, um, uh, trade the technology for market policy, um, has encouraged Chinese firms to rely on imported outdated technologies instead of investing in domestic research. I mean, as you can imagine, multinational would go to, to, to China, share their technology in order to have access to the market, uh, but most likely they did not share the, uh, the best technology, the most advanced technology. And so, for example, with Volkswagen, uh, you know, for 20 years, uh, um, managed to get, you know, big market for some outdated uh, Volkswagen model, okay? Um, uh, but the EV market developed uh, basically domestically. Um, it started from a few firms that copied, um, uh, you know, uh, the technology from mostly Japanese, I think, car and South Korea later, and uh, uh, reverse the engineered and learned, and they started their own businesses. So um, that's how the electro vehicle markets really uh, developed uh, domestically. Now, uh, last point is that, of course, China was, uh, you know, ready to subsidize the market very much. So in 2016, for example, each vehicle sold in China benefited from about $8,000 in government subsidies while in Sweden it was 4,500 and in California only 2,000 per vehicle. Um, which means that in all countries, electrical vehicle market was subsidized, but no one basically could or can afford the level of subsidization that you know, China is uh, 
getting to, to this sector to become number one in the world. So let me um, stop here and uh, uh, transfer the floor to Simon for the second part. Great, thanks very much, Maria. Um, let me share my screen. Can you see it? Yes. Great, excellent. Okay, um, good morning, good afternoon, um, good evening, everyone, depending on where you are. Um, thank you, Mira, for that, that summary of the first um, uh, two thirds of the book. Um, and I'm gonna be summarizing the last third, approximately. Uh, and and the, way I'm, the way I'm going to be doing this is by asking the really important question for policymakers, which is what policies can they, can they leverage to support low carbon technology transfer and innovation? Um, not every country can become a China, um, uh, uh, but you know, every, and every every country is in a different position. But countries really know want to know what these policies are that they can implement. But in order to get there, we're going to need to take a bit of a journey. So, firstly, I'm going to talk about um, whether low carbon technology or LCT transfer is a necessity or an opportunity, which is something that Miriam mentioned briefly at the start of her presentation. Then I'm going to talk about national capabilities um, because it's really, really crucial to understand what capabilities are needed for for LCT transfer. And, and what matter most both across countries and within countries over time, because those are two actually different research questions. And then finally, we'll, we'll get to the point of, of which policies can governments use to accelerate LCT transfer. So on the first point, um, as Miriam showed, uh, we, we have the tools, we have the technologies to, uh, to reduce emissions pretty substantially by uh, 2030. So the next decade, at least, we, we have the technologies that we will need in order to decarbonize. And, and Mira pointed out the, the big four uh, within this uh, 38 gigatons of, of potential uh, uh, emissions abatement, we have big four industrial sectors, which was on the slide that she showed. And these are energy, uh, industry, transport, and buildings. So within those sectors, there's subsectors, right? Uh, which are these. So you've got, uh, for example, CCS and other renewables and wind in the energy sector. In industry, you've got uh, energy efficiency and heat. Um, uh, within automobile, automobiles, you've got uh, EVs. Uh, so within transport, you've got automobiles such as EVs and then also aviation and shipping. And then you've, within buildings, you have lighting and, uh, and other, other things. And these specific subsectors correspond to specific technologies, right? So in order to, um, to reduce emissions by the amounts that we showed, we're gonna need to have a huge ramp up in, tech, in specific technologies, which are known. So for example, in, um, in energy, in the energy sector, we're gonna need a, just a, a huge increase in battery storage from about 0 0.5 gigawatt hours um, in 2015 to about uh, 1,096 in 2030, and then all the way through to 10,400 by 2050. And a similar growth trend is also needed in other technologies like heat pumps and um, EVs. Um, and modern cook stoves um, and, and a few other things. So, so we know which technologies these are, and they're mostly, many of them, capital goods. And many of these capital goods are exportable, right? They're, they're, they're a part of global value chains. And so if, if climate change is going to be mitigated, then we need to have a dramatic increase in trade. And this means these specific technologies, which I pointed out, and a, and a ton of others, um, and these technologies are, are complex, right? They have um, a lot of knowledge embodied within them, uh, and more so than brown technologies. And we know from this very long literature, which I won't go into, called the economic complexity literature, that uh, complex goods have higher knowledge spillovers. So countries that export more complex goods tend to grow faster. And so it's for this reason we think that if you're a policymaker that believes at least that there's a chance that that these technologies will be, um, you know, diffused across countries, then there's a big opportunity here. And so um, the way I like to think about this is that climate change has been called the, the biggest market failure in history. That was Nick Stern many years ago. Um, uh, but the flip side of this is that there's an opportunity, right? Like the, the global diffusion of LCT could potentially be one of the biggest export-led growth opportunities in history. Um, now, if you if accept that, the question is, well, what do we, what do we as policymakers within country X need to do in order to, to take advantage of that potential opportunity? So firstly, you need to think about what national capabilities um, countries have, because they vary dramatically across countries, um, and they also vary depending on the type of LCT transfer that we're talking about, right? So, so we came up with this idea of the um, technology transfer staircase, which corresponds broadly to 
you know, sort of steps of LCT transfer. So if you think of a country that has no LCT whatsoever, the first thing they, they want to do or they might want to do is to diffuse that technology domestically, right? So they have to adopt it, which means they, they import it and then they have to diffuse it when those two things are, are different because scaling technologies can be can be quite difficult. But, but those are two things and that's the import stage, the, two, the first two steps. But then they also might want to produce that technology themselves um, with their manufacturing base and then potentially innovate um, on top of it and then export. So that corresponds to imitation, um, learning um, by, by reverse engineering technologies that you've imported and then perhaps setting up joint ventures with, with foreign companies to, to innovate and to produce domestically. And then finally, um, indigenous innovation where your citizens, your, your firms and your workers uh, innovate and invent themselves with the potential for export. So the key point linking this back somewhat to the, the economic complexity point I made a second ago is that there's more value added at the top steps, right? So there's not a huge amount of, um, of value added if you believe that this is a big export opportunity if you're not exporting, of course, right? And then if you are exporting, then it's, it's more valuable for your domestic firms and workers if they're actually at the top steps where they're, they're innovating and inventing themselves. So that's, a, that's one, one point. And then, so how does this link to, to national capabilities? So this is a big table, um, but, but essentially all we're doing here is going through the different steps of the technology transfer staircase and showing which skills are required, right? Which national capabilities are required. And so, um, and the key point to note here is that as you go up each step, you need deeper levels of, of um, national capability. So for example, for human and organizational capital, right, which are the skills and the, the knowledge of your domestic firms and workers, adoption doesn't require that much uh, in the way of, of human and organizational capital. But as you get across to diffusion and then to imitation, where you have to, you know, your firms have to reverse engineer, What's, what, what you've imported, and then you have to, you know, be able to form structures with um, uh, and, and joint ventures with external companies, if that's the, the right approach that you think um, will get you to, to the top end of the, the staircase, then that requires deeper levels of managerial human cap capability. And then finally, for the very top ste steps, you need um, uh, a lot of a lot of domestic capability in terms of knowledge. Uh, you need a workforce that's able to take opportunities, take risks, has a long-term vision, um, and, and the same is true with institutional and physical capital and, and to a lesser degree, lesser degree, as I will show, surprisingly, perhaps um, financial capital. So as you climb the staircase, you need more capability, more complementary capability of these, these things that I mentioned. So do the matter, you know, I've just said this, right? I've just introduced this, this idea of the staircase. Um, is that, is that the case? Does it seem to be the case across countries? So we take a cross-sectional cut and we use uh, all the data that we have, um, you know, within the bank and, and within other parts of the report. And we looked at um, the, the capability, uh, uh, the links between different types of national capability and, um, and imports, exports and innovation metrics. Okay, so in this case, at the very bottom end, as you'll see in the top left of the, the tech transfer staircase, um, we're comparing the import intensity per capita, LCT import intensity per capita by human capital, organizational capital, institutional capital, and physical capital. And in the dots, the, dot, the sort of orange dots are low income countries, the green are lower middle income countries, and the blue correspond to upper and high income countries. And so you can see there's a pretty strong correlation across all these different types of capability. Um, so human capital, in terms of the human capital index seems to be strongly correlated with LCT import intensity. So countries that have more human capital tend to import significantly more um, LCT uh, 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 per capita. Um, uh, the same is less true, but to some degree true with organizational capital. Uh, the same with institutional capital as, um, as proxied by the government effect effectiveness index. And then finally on physical capital. The same also seems to be the case with exports, which corresponds to the upper steps of the tech transfer staircase. So human capital, again, seems to be very correlated with, um, with export intensity, um, as does organizational uh, capital, institutional capital and physical capital. Um, uh, yeah, the, those things should be saying exports, not imports. I can see it says that on the y-axis. Um, but yeah, so these things seem to matter also for exports. It's also true for general technical, technological innovation. The same four factors seem to matter. 
Um, uh, so there's this innovation, global innovation index, which we can you know, just extract and compare that to human capital, organizational capital, institutional capital. Same story. These things seem to really, really matter. Um, and then once you combine these things into a median of normalized scores, so you take those four measures that I, that I mentioned, you normalize them, and then you take the median for each country, and, and you correlate that with the global innovation index, you find that actually this, uh, these four measures seem to explain a significant amount of, of technological innovation. So the R squared here is 0.87. You know, it's not, not a bad indication a priori that there's a strong correlation here. And then also potentially some evidence that these forms of national capability are complementary, right? So you need human, human capital, but also organizational capital in order to, to you know, reverse engineer and to then uh, innovate and export. So that's a bit of the intuition. Um, but then we have this, this issue where LCT exports um, uh, and as well as imports, but I'm just pointing out exports here, seem to be increasing in some countries and decreasing in other countries, right? So what I showed you was a, was a cut of, you know, one time period across countries. Uh, what are these, what are these, you know, uh, how do these factors um, correlate? And it seems like uh, actually, if you look over time, then some countries are, are, are developing and exporting more LCT and others are not. So what explains that? And for that question, we have to look within countries over time, which is a, a, different, a slightly different research question. And so for this, we do um, a, a, a pretty simple fixed effects uh, star regression analysis where we operationalize the different forms of capability that I mentioned, and we compare those to um, to uh, log LCT exports and imports across countries. So what this is showing is the uh, effect on, um, on the percent effect of a change in, for example, GDP on the change of uh, uh, LCT import intensity per capita across countries. Um, and it sort of controls for you know, unobserved um, time invariant character characteristics because it's a fixed effects regression. So there's a big table with lots of different things in it, but I want to point out four things. So firstly, uh, GDP, as you would expect, does seem to be um, associated with increasing LCT import and export intensity. So as countries grow and get bigger, they tend to import, but actually even more, they tend to export LCT. So that's, you know, it's not surprising necessarily, um, that finding. But what's perhaps more finding is that financial capital does not seem to have that strong an association with LCT transfer as proxied, of course, by trade here. That's that's the, the proxy that we're using. So it seems like for um, for you know a one percentage increase in in financial credit to domestic firms, there's you know a 0.004 percent increase in LCT import intensity. So that's not very high, and we didn't find um, any uh, any significant statistically significant effect on exports. So that's interesting because many people think that finance is the constraint. Finance must be the constraint to the diffusion and development of these technologies. And, and that's, you know, we have some evidence that might not be the case. And then on organizational institutional capital, these two factors don't seem to matter as much as you might um, think uh, within countries over time. So, um, so for organizational capital, there's some correlation there and association that's statistically significant with imports and exports. Uh, but it's not that strong for imports especially and then institutional capital we didn't really find a strong effect either for uh, import or export intensity but then the, the important things i want to point out are, are these two factors so firstly physical capital so physical capital seems to be uh, pretty strongly um, associated with lct import and export intensity right so as you build which which makes sense intuitively as you build uh, and invest more in your infrastructure in your in your energy system in your public transportation networks then then intuitively you should be able to diffuse these technologies, these low carbon technologies that rely on the infrastructure uh, more easily. And, 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 and to a lesser degree, you can then also export those technologies. So that, that is reasonably intuitive. But then finally, perhaps the most um, important of these, of these national capability factors, it seems from this analysis at least, is human capital. And so this is, this is not climate education, this is just general education. So human capital deepening, um, defined uh, here as the Human Development Index Educational Score. So as countries develop and get better scores on, on that system, they, uh, they, they increase their LCT imports, but actually they very significantly increase their LCT exports in particular. And that is kind of intuitive as well, because as I mentioned, getting to the top of the staircase, doing you know, the invention um, uh, and, and you know, collaborative or, or indigenous requires a significant amount of knowledge and human capital. So it seems like education just um, 
you know, um, excluding any consideration of whether that education relates to climate or anything else, it seems like education really does seem to matter for diffusing and developing low carbon technologies. So now that I've given you that whole you know, discussion of what seems to matter, uh, looking at the data across and within countries over time, the question arises, okay, which policies can countries use to accelerate low carbon technology transfer? And once you start looking at the, the, the literature as, as, as we did uh, extensively on, um, on LCT transfer and on innovation, you find thousands of studies. This has been very, very uh, heavily studied. Um, uh, for example, in Appendix E, we provide a um, uh, basically a, a, a summary of a summary of summaries if that makes sense. So this is this is essentially a summary of all the different instruments and the policies that countries could leverage for general innovation. Uh, and, and we look at the empirical evidence and show like whether it's mostly positive, ambivalent or, or, or negative across different instruments. I won't go into that, but this draws upon 1200 studies to give you a sense of the literature that's out there. But I think it's more important to, to think about the, uh, the policies specifically for low carbon technologies and linking that to national capabilities. And so this is what we do in the book. We say, OK, well, there's, uh, you know, human and organizational capital, like I mentioned, institutional capital and financial capital. Um, those are your national capabilities. But then there's different types of policies. There's different policies in terms of the way that they work. Right. So you have, for example, systemic policies, which are your broad macroeconomic. It's, it, it's your broad framework that, that firms and workers operate within. And uh, so, for example, this this includes your fiscal framework, like tax taxes and subsidies, um, your educational and health spending, um, and then for specific, you know, we're going quite deep into specific um, uh, LCT relevant uh, policies. So, for institutional capital, um, you've got low carbon capital deepening, such as investing in EV charging networks and smart grids that affects your institutional and physical capital, and then for financial capital, we've got sort of you know big de-risking private investment instruments, which are just very broad, right? So these are the broad systemic policies. And the way that links to, to, to the national capability is that these systemic policies and these policies should in some sense push and draw, draw upon, but also push those national capabilities that you have. And so, with, but that, that differs to the demand pull and the, tech, and the tech push policies. So demand pull policies, what you're effectively doing is you're creating demand for these, for these products. Simple as that, right? You're, you're creating a market. And so in the case of um, uh, supportive fiscal expenditures, such as feed-in tariffs, um, you're creating a market for new renewable energy technology to be diffused domestically. And, and by doing that, you're also encouraging new firms and new skills to be created in your economy. And that's also true um, for, for you know, other reforms, such as energy market reforms and bringing the financial system in the case of the financial capital that you have. And then finally, there's tech push policies. And what these do, they say, um, I, as a policymaker, I believe that um, the heat pumps that I, that I mentioned earlier, which are expected, you know, under that framing to have a big increase in diffusion globally. So I want to really push that specific technology by creating an incubator that focuses on that particular related technologies or set up prizes, for example. And then there's, there's, there's other policies such as green industrial policies that probably do the same thing. Or then there's state driven um, green finance where you, you set up green investment banks that, that target those specific technologies. So how does this all link together? So the point here is that these policies, these different policies matter for different stages of the tech transfer staircase. So firstly, systemic policies, such as your fiscal frameworks, they matter throughout all of the stages of, of the transfer staircase, right? For adoption, diffusion, indigenous innovation. You can't, it's difficult to adopt and to invent new low carbon technologies if you're heavily subsidizing fossil fuels. It just doesn't make economic sense for firms and workers in your economy. Um, however, for demand pool and tech push, they're slightly different. So for demand pool policies, those are really great policies for diffusing um, and for adopting and diffusing existing technology from outside. You import, you diffuse domestically. And then for tech push policies, those are, are, are better suited to the top of the, the tech transfer staircase. So this just links that together to show that, hey, look, you know, these are the policies that I showed and here, here's how they map to the different stages of the tech transfer staircase and countries will be at different stages. It's not necessarily linear, um, but it's it's a way of thinking about how to how to address and how to target these policies depending on your own national capability and your objectives. So and, and after having done all this work, as we did, uh, and if, you know, sort of gun to my head, I was asked which policies do I think matter the most? Um, I, I would say for any country that's thinking about this, I would say start with systemic policies and, and ex specifically um, your fiscal framework, your educational health, health spending, 
And then finally, most relevant for COVID and the post-COVID recovery plans, uh, make sure that the capital deepening, which means really your infrastructure investment plans, which many countries are drawing up right now, is, it's, is low carbon. Uh, because that's really, really important across this uh, this staircase. So, so focus on I I implementing policies like carbon taxes. You know, do tax shifting, tax carbon, not work and investment. You know, do do a revenue neutral thing or raise revenues to invest in your education and your health system because those seem to very, very much matter. Um, and then finally, make your your post recovery uh, green through um, through investing in things like EV charging networks, grid technology, and public transportation. So overall, the recommendations from this, and there's a lot more in, in, the, in the book, but I, you know, the, these are the key ones. I'd say match your policy mix, and it's important to have a mix of policies. Don't just rely on one instrument, um, but, but vary that mix depending on, wh on where you sit or where you think you sit as a country, as a policymaker on the staircase. Um, for deployment, focus on demand pool policies. Make a market for LCT so they can be deployed. For LCT production, focus on tech push policies. Um, uh, you know, you can be um, somewhat technology neutral, although that we go into the book on how technology neutrality is not necessarily neutral. We can talk about that later potentially. Um, and then for deployment and production, most important is to get systemic policies right, such as your tax policies, get energy prices right, get um, your fiscal policies, get your invest in your health and your education system. So alter those instruments. Um, in the policy mix by your desired, your current, your desired levels of national capability. Um, uh, generally, we think finance might be less constraining than you think for this problem of um, LCT diffusion and production. Ed education seems to matter a lot, which is an interesting finding, um, that there's a link between you know, sustainability and education um, and human capital. And then post-COVID, make your infrastructure investments um, LCT friendly. And then finally, whatever you do, be consistent, credible, comprehensive and strategic. It's a long literature on, on how it's very important to signal to your domestic workers and firms that you're going to be doing these things and you do so in a consistent, coherent, credible, transparent, strategic, um, comprehensive way. Um, so to conclude, um, Mira's pre presentation and my own. So, uh, so we already have the tools and technologies needed to, to contain global warming for the next decade at least um, and, and somewhat beyond that. These technologies need to be transferred on a massive scale to developing countries where most of the emissions um, are expected to occur. And transferring technology is not just a necessity, but an opportunity, right, to help countries grow faster. And some countries and some policymakers won't believe that for various different reasons, totally fine. But for those that do, then these are the sorts of things they can do to, um, to climb the, the, the tech transfer ladder. They can implement policies aligned with their national capabilities and objectives and indeed push those capabilities. And then finally, a final point to make post COVID recovery green, make infrastructure investments LCT friendly. I can't stress this enough. There's already been, I think, $12 trillion uh, uh, globally um, drawn up in plans for post COVID recoveries. And so make those investments LCT friendly and focus on education and skills whilst getting energy prices right. And so that's the end of our presentation. And thank you very much. I'll hand back to Elena. Oh, sorry, to Valentina. I, I will do that. I'll, I'll just we'll just uh, make the transition smooth. So let me take the um, the control of the the slide deck. Thank you, Michael. Um, thank you, Simon, and, and thank you, Miria, for the um, for the presentation. Um, so I have the pleasure of being commenting on this book, which uh, uh, many of you may think is not uh, necessarily a pleasure because I have to get into five minutes basically or 10 minutes a bunch of questions that i had from reading um a large part i have to say of this uh, uh, of this work so uh, let me start by saying one thing i think that this book in my opinion could not be more timely um technology development and transfer um it's, it's well known is one of the means of implementations uh, of the unfccc uh, it does play a crucial role in mitigating climate change while at the same time addressing sustainable development goals, which is basically the direction in which uh, ideally all countries uh, and the world uh, um, as a whole should move. And the, the, the nice feature that I like about this work is that it focuses on technology, but it actually talks a lot about more. It treats technology in the context uh, of uh, capacity building, of finance, of institutions, and uh, specifically capacity building and finance are actually the other two means of implementation in the context of the UNFCCC. And uh, um, this is actually at the core of a lot of the de debate around technological innovation right now. On the hand, you have people claiming 
claiming that worrying about technology is enough. And on the other hand, you have those uh, raising concerns about the fact that you may have technology, but then if you don't have the capabilities uh, to put them into practice and to further develop the, them, you may not actually um, achieve uh, what is achievable. So to summarize, uh, uh, using the exact word of the book, uh, the book shows that uh, it shows how achieving the Paris Agreement goals uh, presents uh, an immense challenge, but also uh, it shows uh, uh, that, uh, um, that this, uh, which is uh, of course dependent on fossil fuel and the tremendous barriers, is actually achievable. Uh, the five chapter of the book um, show that uh, uh, what they call themselves limited but encouraging progress can be achieved uh, in LCT transfer. Uh, and uh, the book highlights the key obstacles uh, of deployment and innovation and uh, most importantly presents very, very practical recommendations. So the practical recommendations, which you all will find if you um, scan through the executive summary, I think are very interesting at first sight because uh, they exactly do what I was, I was talking about. They talk about the importance of effective policies uh, for energy prices to get them right, uh, but at the same time for building human capacity, for building physical uh, capital, institutional capital. Uh, they talk about uh, um, private investment, which is a very important part. The private sector in the development of low carbon technology is actually um, a key player, and it also must be a key player moving on. Um, recommendations start, touch upon the man pool policies and technology push policies, as well as systemic policies, uh, um, as we were uh, just uh, being told, and uh, uh, the in fundamental role of trade um, and the, the, the key role of international property right, rights agreements. One of the things that uh, the book delves into a little bit is also this, this issue of uh, uh, to climb the technology ladder, you also somehow need to um, go against uh, the barriers and the resistance uh, from people who hold the patent rights, for instance, or, or uh, the ownership of a given technology. And uh, finally, they point to the role that the UNFCCC can help, uh, can have in facilitating the transfer to poorest countries. This is actually a very important uh, concern. Uh, to, in my opinion, this work is, is very comprehensive. It raises a lot of questions. It presents some evidence um, and uh, um, there is a ton of stuff that I would like to raise and discuss, and, and uh, um, I will uh, most likely follow up, uh, you know, with my very long list of questions. Here, for the interest of time, I decided to focus on a very few of those, um, and the ones that I picked, uh, in my opinion, are relevant for my own research, from uh, my involvement in, in current project, and I think importantly for the IPCC assessment report six cycle, uh, which is, uh, as you may know, the first uh, assessment report that has a specific chapter on technology innovation and transfer. Um, so let me let me just uh, make a few comments. Uh, the main point of the book, I think it's a refreshing one, is we already have the technologies that can help us contain global warming and meet uh, to a great extent the Paris Agreement goal. Okay, And in fact, th this claim is somewhat uh, uh, in contrast uh, with a lot of the talk uh, uh, that's been going on in several circles regarding our ability to meet uh, um, the appropriate emission reduction um, uh, going forward. And uh, um, now I welcome that because I think that if we get stuck on what we we cannot do, we're not even going to take the first step. And it's important to say that there are things that we can do. On the other hand, uh, this message may be taken, and I'm not suggesting that the book does so, but it may be taken by some as, uh, you know, an indication that we don't need anything more, that what we have is sufficient. So the, therefore, there should be no further, you know, investment in additional technologies and specifically in technologies which are um, the center of a high uh, of, a, of a very heated debate which is actually um, which comprehend uh, solar radiation management and negative emission technologies including ccs for instance but even uh, more radical ones um, uh, the important chart I think that they that they show, which I uh, reproduce here in very uh, small, is that uh, we can achieve a lot with what we have. However, if you look carefully at the at the um, at the graph, at the picture, it shows you exactly the history of investment in low carbon technologies. There is a lot of potential in energy, and there is a lot less potential in key hard to decarbonize sectors, which are, for instance, buildings, agriculture, uh, transportation, and industry. There's, the bars there are much lower, right? And so um, 
the main claim hinges also on this assumption that we would be able to um, develop and deploy these technologies very fast in the same way across different countries in very different institutional uh, conditions. But climate negotiation, as a matter of fact, show that certain countries are actually very eager to, uh, to, to take a U-turn, to actually, you know, even get out of the Paris Agreement, to name uh, one specific country. And so uh, my question is, in this context of limited commitment and cooperation, what should be the right balance between deploying what we have uh, and searching for improved and even perhaps drastic solutions? How should we worry? How should we weigh these two, the two, these two opportunities? My second comment is actually to do with the focus on China. I think not enough is said about what China is doing uh, um, in uh, low carbon technology development and deployment. And I think that this book contributes to this debate in an important way. However, if you look at what China is doing, China is also one of the top exporters of coal efficient technologies. And most often, especially with respect uh, and specifically towards certain countries in, in Africa, China is known to have deployed and, and diffused their um, inefficient uh, coal based technologies, for instance. And so it, to me, um, why we should point the light to the good things that are happening there, there is also a question about idiosyncratic policies and how, how all, all these policies should be aligned. So, um, do low carbon technologies, as defined in this book, include fossil fuel based uh, but efficient technologies, right? So, for instance, efficient technology in industries, gas, and so on. Should they be considered part of low carbon technology given, uh, you know, the heated debate about the rebound effect, which I'm just going to mention here? Should the attention in this context be focused not only on low carbon technology, but perhaps uh, on the direction of technical change and of innovation. And there is a, a large literature on, you know, uh, direct tec technical change and the relative importance of clean versus fossil efficient versus dirty, dirty technology. My, um, my third comment relates not specifically to technology, but rather to the presence of entrenched inter uh, uh, interests and mega friends. So, we are going to decarbonize, uh, we're going to have to decarbonize, and the world is changing in the meantime, right? So we need to take into account that. And uh, the framework conditions in which we carry out low carbon technology transfer and innovation are significantly affected by several, um, you know, ongoing processes. And to me, one of the most important ones is the digitalization, which is a macro trend, mega trend that is actually. Um, somewhat independent and it's it's moving, uh, you know, autonomously uh, societies uh, in, in several directions. And so this will strongly impact technological availability, energy demand, energy efficiency, but also labor market demand uh, and, um, and governance. So with digitalization in this context, do you believe act as a barrier or as an enabler to the diffusion and the further development of low carbon technology in developing countries, perhaps specifically? And uh, lastly, my uh, last question is on the role of, of international, national, and regional institutions. The recommendations, as I think, are very well summarized and very clear, very practical from this book. But the question is that we're going to have to put them into practice fast. And so what is the role of institutions? And among them, um, also the World Bank, the IMF, the WTO, for instance, in promoting this implementation, the implementation of this recommendation. Is there a plan to reflect these recommendations and these key important messages into practice and, uh, you know, into um, effective and, and rapid policy making? So, as I was mentioning, I have a bunch more questions, but uh, for the time being, I leave it at that. Um, open, uh, I, I see that there are also questions from the audience. So, let me give, uh, um, let me stop sharing and give uh, uh, the um, uh, floor back to Miria and uh, Simon to answer. Yes, so let me thank you again for these uh, presentations and thank you Elena for your discussion. Uh, we have a few questions, so um, uh, I, I was trying to group them. I think uh, you know, the, the first I will start from um, it was repeated by different um, uh, different participants uh, and relates to the fact uh, comment that you made at some point, media that was sort of a, um, 
you know, generating some attention on the fact that we have all the technologies we have, uh, we need. Uh, and Simon, I think, sort of uh, went back to that. And the uh, questions uh, that you received are related to negative emissions. So the fact that uh, uh, there's several studies saying and claiming that to get two degrees or 1.5, you need negative emissions. So what about those technologies? Uh, are they ready? What is uh, uh, and whether uh, the potential of these technologies might actually have a, a hampering effect on innovation at cities. And then uh, uh, let me uh, add on, this was uh, were questions by Srikar Pradhan, but let me add on Maurizio Migliore, who's also asking, what about nuclear? Is nuclear part of the story uh, uh, and how relevant that is? And I think with to that, uh, 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 and then come back with the second set of questions. Okay, shall I start? Maybe, maybe yes. Maybe you could take it first, and then Simon can, can yeah, jump in. Yeah. So let, let's go. I'll, I'll start, and then Simon will take it over, and we go back and forth. Um, great questions. Um, thank you very much. So I, I want to start from probably the, the first couple of questions um, that Elena uh, put forward and, and also what we just heard from you. Um, uh, kind of uh, uh, disclaimer, if, if you want to, particular, I, I'm not, you know, uh, uh, very much expert in the in different types of technology. My point of view is, of course, I'm from the World Bank and I've worked a lot in developing countries. So I've been very much influenced by uh, the situation in many developing countries where capabilities are, um, you know, low. Uh, and yet they have, for example, they have the sun, they have the wind, they have geothermal energy. And so what you would need is some help you know, from to these countries really develop low carbon uh, growth. And I have in mind, for example, Caribbean countries, they all have geothermal okay, uh, energy. You, you just have to get it up. And so uh, this technology, like uh, other technologies, they, their characteristics are that they have a high upfront cost and then, of course, low operating cost uh, down the line. But they require, you know, long, uh, longer term invest, investment uh, that usually maybe private investors are not able to do. So there is where some intervention from uh, um, states or some international organization is, is needed. Um, now, why, why do we focus so much on the transfer? Because uh, uh, it's really about the private sector. I mean, it, it's not, you know, it's not about the World Bank or other intermediates. If we look at how technology has moved and, uh, um, and in, who does the investment is the private sector. So the private sector would invest in technologies that are, you know, sure things, commercially available, they can get financing and, and these exist and that they can be transferred relatively easily to countries with low capabilities but that which are already producing emissions you know uh, and these emissions are increasing so that that, that i think uh, where you you have i mean in no way we're saying that you know we should stop uh, uh, research uh, uh, on you know new technology they will be needed and and and, and very much much so um, but what is uh, stopping, if you want, to the development of, uh, uh, of you know, low carbon technology is mostly is policies. Um, and at the international level, for example, if you recall in 2014, you had 46 members of the World Trade Organization, the WTO, that initiated the discussions on uh, um, an environmental uh, goods agreement uh, called the EGA, uh, designed to remove all the barriers uh, to trade in goods uh, with the pot, uh, with the positive environmental climate change impact. Now the the negotiation is very political. Sometimes you you know we start looking at which product is there, why these products are not there. It's very very political. So much so that it was stopped 
me. But I think one of the first things would be really to, to help, uh, uh, I don't know how, I don't know how, but you know, to make sure that these uh, uh, negotiations continue because having uh, environmental goods, uh, uh, mitigation goods, <laughs> technologies that can be traded at low cost, that's key. Um, and the same goes with the foreign direct investments, the more restriction there are, you know, the more difficult it is to, to move on. Simon. Yeah, thank, thanks, Mira. I, I, I totally agree with, with what you said. And um, I think to just to, to add to what you're saying and, and, and to also go through what you know, the, the questions posed by uh, Elena and, and the audience as well, I think in terms of the in, in terms of the the innovations and the technologies, so so we were presenting technologies that can help us halve emissions from current levels by 2030, which is what we need to to achieve the 1.5 you know, degree target ultimately, right? So so we're kind of shifting the debate a little bit, or trying to by saying, look, like it's not it's not that technology will save us it's that we have the technology but it's a last mile problem we need to diffuse these technologies and that's just not happening at the scale that we need uh, uh in order to mitigate climate change and it's specifically not happening in developing countries especially emerging markets where you know the vast majority of emissions growth are going to be in these countries and um, and they're simply not diffusing uh, and and also not you know innovating themselves in in these technologies but if they if, if they if they wanted to grasp the opportunity provided by global decarbonization, then there is an opportunity for them to grow sustainably, to, 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 to abate emissions, and then also grow based on those emissions. But I think one thing that links to the um, to the direction of innovation question that, that Elena pointed out there um, is, is that essentially we need a refashioning of the way that we think about policy, the way that national policymakers think about innovation. So right now, I'm, uh, some of the questions were on you know very specific technologies, and then um, and then you know but and then a big problem amongst you know certain economists is hey we shouldn't be thinking even about technologies and industrial policy was a big failure and you know we can't pick winners and it creates corruption and all these sorts of things so I think the way to think about this from a policymaker is not as a sort of benevolent central planner that has all the information and it's certainly not as well as just sort of a hands-off um, policymaker where the market will solve everything and these technologies will just will just arrive I think it's it's important to think more like a um, like an impact investor, right? So I like this idea, for example, that um, uh, Mariana Mazzucati talks about the, the green entrepreneurial state. That's a sort of example where instead of being, you know, a planner or, you know, just somebody who stands by the by the bylines, you, you make little bets, right? You make lots of little bets. So nuclear, maybe some countries, you know, it's not even possible given the political situation. Maybe some other countries, small scale nuclear, they might be willing to invest in those things um, possibly, but maybe it'll work out, maybe it won't. Um, but it certainly you know, won't happen independently in the private sector. It would need a push from, from the public sector. The same applies to CDR technologies, right? So carbon dioxide removal. So we will need to go not just to zero, but to go negative by mid-century. That's what um, I think four of the five scenarios in the IPCC's 1.5 degree report showed. And in order to do that, we will for sure need um, carbon sequestration. And that includes you know, the sort of standard technologies we know of, such as um, you know, agricultural practices. But it also potentially includes, you know, um, sucking carbon out of the air. And there are some um, some companies that are doing those things. But in order for those things to happen um, and to be and to be profitable and to be diffused, we still need these policies. Right. So, uh, for example, to currently to to take a, a one ton of CO2 out of the out of the atmosphere um, in, in the small scale that's being done in places like um, like Iceland and and um, and I think Canada and a few other places, it costs about two hundred dollars per ton uh, for carbon. And there's there's no profitable way that companies can currently sell that. I think it's currently going towards helping oil companies extract more oil from their, from their current uh, uh, wells. So, however, all these companies say, look, if we had a carbon price and we were paid to actually, you know, sequester this carbon, then it would make us much more able to invest in the long term, much more able to do these things. So we need carbon pricing, not just to disincentivize, um, you know, carbon dioxide, um, uh, you know, emissions themselves, but also to encourage abatement. And that includes sequestration in the future, which, which we will for sure need. Um, and then one, one, one quick thing as well on, on digitalization, which Elena mentioned. So I do think digitalization is, she asked, you know, is it, is it um, an enabler or is it a barrier? I think it's, it's potentially an enabler, but I think it is for sure a justification that we need to, to deploy these technologies. So why is it an enabler? If you think about what we need to do globally, 
we, in order to mitigate climate change, we need to decarbonize the power sector, right? Coal is by far and away the worst thing you could burn from the perspective of climate and it's being burned on a massive scale globally. After that, we also need to get rid of natural gas because it's still only half the, the carbon dioxide emissions per, per unit of what hour uh, produced. So we need to decarbonize the electricity system and then, and then we need to um, electrify end uses of technology. And so the way this links to digitalization is that digitalization can help with both, right? So with digitalization on the, the power sector side, we can, we can have better and more smart grid technology, right? Demand response technologies, which effectively acts like um, a power plant in some degree, right? So you have companies and you pay them to, to, um, to reduce their, air, you know, their electricity consumption by reducing their, um, uh, and turning down their air conditioning at certain type, times of peak power. And that basically acts like a power plant effectively. And we can do that better once we have better digitalization technologies. With the electrifying of end use, Think about EVs, right? So all most, almost all vehicles on the road right now are, are powered by fossil fuels, but EVs are coming on the road gradually. And there's a bit of a hockey stick actually the last the last um, few years as the IEA's report which came out, um, I think last week on global EVs shows, we've got, you know, we've gone from 2 million to 5 million in the space of years. So there's a big increase. And one of the things driving that is the attractiveness of automation, right? So um, there's now a, a lot of companies that want to automate um, trucks, truck drives, especially in the US. And, and the digitalization, the ability to do that through uh, AI and through digitalization makes um, electrifying end uses a lot more attractive, right? Um, why is this a justification? Because we're going to need to do it anyway, right? So, so these, elect these digitalization trends, they are happening. They're happening irrespective of climate change. Um, uh, and the, the point is that these, these uh, digitalization things will, will draw more electricity and more power from the system, right? So we've had... Um, electricity demand consumed globally increased by a factor of three in the last four decades, and it's doubled in the last two decades. And that trend will continue. So we're going to keep consuming more and more electricity globally, especially in, in big growth markets. And so if we're going to mitigate uh, climate change, we need to decarbonize the, the electricity system. So it's enabler and also justification. Yeah, maybe uh, there was a question, I think, about China. I, I I agree completely. I mean, China may be the largest importer and exporters of low carbon technology, but it is uh, also, I mean, with with, uh, with the India, uh, China and India are the largest uh, producers of coal. Um, uh, you know, and but of course, Australia, US, Indonesia so produce excess coals and they export. So. As we have seen from the graph, coal is not disappearing at all. Um, on the contrary, I think both China and India will continue to produce coal and to use it for a long time. So, you know, uh, probably uh, the development of technologies to make uh, coal less uh, uh, dangerous, uh, um, you know, for, for climate, uh, it, it is important because there is no way we can stop the production of coal, uh, in, at least in the short run. Um, so that, that's where technology, I think, is, is needed. Uh, I, we, we thought that the next, or at least we'll write a paper on what China is doing in terms of, you know, uh, uh, taking out the industry to the world and building uh, coal, mm, power station around the world. I mean, particularly in Africa, where there was very, very little coal. Um, but that's what they are doing now, I think, in many countries. Um, in terms of the UNF UNFCCC, um, I don't know if it has done um, enough for technology transfer. Um, but it certainly could have a more important role towards the uh, poorest countries um, because no one is kind of looking after the poorest countries. Um, while I, I, I really think that the private sector will do much of the work in, uh, you know, in moving and transferring technologies through you know, FDI and trade. But the uh, poorest countries should be the focus of uh, UNFCCC that now, for example, the UNFCCC doesn't even recognize or, or does not even have a strategy for south-to-south -south transfer of technology. Mm -hmm. And uh, 
sure it is even needed, but it's still, you know, this old idea of north to south. Um, <clears throat> and, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, for example, buying, you know, existing patents uh, and, and paying for, you know, transferring these into poorest, the poorest countries and help them uh, with uh, uh, building some of the capabilities necessary at least to import and operate technology they don't have to become immediately exporters but um you know by importing and using existing like say the solar panels or the, the wind turbines that's what i think the public action international public action should focus on so um Given, you know, for the sake of time, I just want to do two things. So the first is in many have asked about presentation and recording, and yes, it will be available on CMCC website. And then there's uh, several uh, questions which will be um, given to the uh, presenters. Uh, I just want to point out that there are suggestions on the use, the possibility of using the regulatory indicators for sustainable energy. That is an indicator that the World Bank uh, um, calculates uh, and see how it influences LCT transfer to look at the implication of LCT transfer, not only on emissions, but also to, on poverty and see whether it can play out at a larger scale of sustainability, not just on emission. And then maybe to think of breaking down the analysis by middle, low income and, and high income countries. And I think then there's several questions uh, at the end, again, point not to low carbon technologies, but uh, to negative emissions technologies and whether you can say something on you know transfer of those technologies as well which are actually you know very preliminary but maybe you know one could look at ccs but uh given that we have used up our time i just want to thank again uh, uh miriam and simon for the great presentation uh information about the book and uh, the recording of this webinar is going to be as i said online and then i want to thank elena for reading the book and suggesting uh and, and making her you know the first questions and all of you for paying attention so thank thanks again and have a great day night or morning <laughs> Thank you, Thank you very much. Thanks so much. Thank you, Thank you everybody.